So rigged animation versus hand-drawn frame-by-frame animation has been debated frequently, and ultimately what you use will come down to your personal preference. Rigged animation is going to be faster for long-term projects, and has the advantage of keeping styles consistent when you're working with multiple people. The downside is that it's not as flexible as hand-drawn animation and frame-by-frame -frame stuff. Additionally, rigged animation is a little bit more complicated to think about, whereas hand-drawn animation, while it takes significantly longer to do, is a lot more straightforward. It's good to learn how to do both, but what I'm going to be showing here is how to create a rig so that we can start doing puppeted animation. Puppet animation is what I predominantly use myself, just because it's something I'm accustomed to since I started with 3D animation myself. Basically, puppet animation relies on one central principle that you always need to keep in mind. If it moves, it's a unique object. Never forget this. Most every single part in a rig is going to be a unique symbol. This means to animate the arm bending, you'd move the forearm and the bicep around instead of drawing every single separate frame out. For this tutorial, I'm going to be using a few plugins. The Janimation tools, which provide me a few hotkeys as well as the rig tool, Zero Transform, which sets an object's default orientation and anchor, and Keyframe Caddy, which I don't really use in the rigging process, but rather my components are built around it because it provides some interesting functionality. So I basically have this broken down into a few core rules. Rule number one, each part gets its own symbol. If it ever has a chance of moving, symbolize it. How you design the components is completely up to you. You can use Flash's built-in vectoring tools, or draw them by hand, or use external software such as Inkscape or Illustrator. Note that Flash really kind of sucks for drawing, so you really have to work with it and have to be really patient. Once you make a component and have it named, it's very helpful to actually set it to single frame, by the way. I'll go into why later. On top of this, you want to make sure that every single symbol name is completely unique. Failure to do so can result in inconsistencies in your library, which will corrupt your assets and delete things. Make sure your object gets its own layer as well. Let me tell you, there's nothing more frustrating than completing a rig, starting to animate, and going in one day and seeing that your components are completely missing or are blank because you failed to name them correctly. Another tip as well, this is completely optional, but when you create an object, it can be immensely helpful to zero out the anchor points in orientation. The rig tool and zero transform plugins can make this process much easier. The anchor point is where the object rotates around, so say for the forearm, you'd want the anchor point at the elbow. Now to demonstrate what zero transform and the rig tool can do and why this is all helpful. Say I drew this arm at an angle. When I make it into a symbol, the anchor will go to one of these nine locations. By default for me, it's in the center. If I rotate the arm, it'll rotate around the center instead. Furthermore, I can't easily extend or squash the arm. I have to do some weird bizarre stuff with skews, which Flash will handle very weird if I ever decided to tween this. I can move the anchor point to where I want it to be, but this won't be the default location, so pulling the object out of the library means I have to make sure that the anchor stays consistent. To make it the default location and to correct the orientation of the object, there's a tool called Zero Transform, the plugin I mentioned before. All I need to do is rotate the symbol to an upright position, move the anchor to where I want, and run the Zero Transform plugin. Now the object is completely centered on its hinge, and its horizontal and vertical scalers will now match its orientation. Note that when grabbing copies from your library, your anchors might still be off and might go to the center. To fix this, you can just double click the anchor to reset it to its default location, because the default location is defined by this little crosshair. One thing to keep in mind with anchors is that they don't just affect how things rotate, they also affect how things are tweened together. An object will be tweened between its anchors, not between its frame data. Inconsistent anchors basically can lead to an object jumping around, even if it's the same symbol. I'd also like to provide a quick demo of the Janimation tools with the Rig tool, because it's a very useful thing and you should totally get it. Once you have the tool set up, just select your object data, grab the tool, click where you want the anchor to be by default, and then drag out an arrow parallel to the object's orientation. This will automatically define a symbol at the angle you define and even set it to single frame for you. The only thing that's kind of a bit annoying to me, which isn't really a big deal about this tool, is that if you want an object to be oriented downward, such as this arm, you have to draw the arrow in reverse. But otherwise, this is a very helpful tool that can greatly speed up the rigging process. So hopefully this is all clear on how it's useful. When you have a lot of rotary movement, a well-placed anchor reduces the amount of position changes you need to make, and makes the process not only easier to animate, but often looks better outright when using tweens. In fact, as a test, try animating an arm bend where one group of symbols has standard centered anchor points, and the other one has anchor points centered around the joints. The forearm will still need a few intermittent frames, but it will be way easier to animate with the latter. Rule number two is a concept I like to call overlap. This isn't very hard to understand, but it's very hard to master. When you have two objects that connect together, you create what's called overlap. 
Objects have a layer order, so one's on top of the other, and you need to make sure that the parts that are hidden mesh well with the parts that are displayed. Overlap is basically making sure that stuff looks like it fits together well during all normal angles of motion, and that the objects don't clip through one another and don't create gaps. You don't want to make pixel-perfect meshes that can only exist at one angle. As I said, it's easy to understand but hard to master, so you just need to always keep it in mind. When I set my rig here to transparent, you can actually see where the overlap exists and where it's weak, where it's strong, etc. It's honestly something that you also want to kind of continually adapt as you use a rig, because you're probably not going to get it right the very first time. I might not be spending a lot of time talking about overlap, but keep in mind that it is a very important rule. Now, rule number three. This is about simplification. Simplify your objects where you can. The fewer symbols you use, the more organized your library will be, the simpler your timeline will be, and the lower file size your file will be. Don't be superfluous. If you can reuse a symbol, do so. If you can combine objects, do so. For instance, very easy example. The arms, you do not need to have duplications of the arms for the left and the right. You can just use one object for both and just mirror them. Partnered with simplification, grow accustomed to using nesting. A nest refers to any contents, particularly symbols, inside of another symbol. In many cases, you do not need all the items on the main timeline. If there's a group of items that are linked together or always move together, you can turn them into a nested symbol. One of the most prominent examples of this is the head. Heads often contain various nested symbols, such as the skull, the hair, the eyes, the mouths, the nose, etc. The point of organizational nesting basically keeps all linked parts together in a single symbol, which simplifies your timeline significantly. I actually have another tutorial that talks a lot about nesting, which you can watch here. You can even have an animation within a nest and use Play One's playback with a graphic symbol, such as for dialogue and blinks, so it stays synchronous with the rest of the body. You can even have nests inside of nests, such as I do with the eyes. There's also something nesting related that I like to call frame states, which I'll go into next on the next rule. While each part has its own internal timeline and has nested data in it, I personally like to use nested symbols extensively for the hands, head, eyes, and in this case, the hair. So you've made it this far through the tutorial. You actually technically know enough about the core rules behind puppet rigging that you can start rigging yourself. However, there's one rule that I feel gives you a significant edge when making rigs. This is something I like to call frame states. I'm kind of hyping it up to be revolutionary, but it's fairly simple for people who have been working with Flash for a long time. When I go into the symbol here, you might notice that I have a layer that has notes for profile, three quarter, and front. Each of them is 10 frames long. I also have nested animation data for each object. Each part here has the components that exist for these three angles. So for instance, if I go to three quarter under the labeling, I will have components that are three quarters only. The reason why I provide 10 frames for each angle is so that way I can add in alternate variations without disrupting the rest of the timeline here. So like if I need to have a variation of the torso that is clothed and one that's not clothed, I can have those as two separate states within the same angle. Or if I want to have like a smear or a deformation of an arm or something, I can add those in again without disrupting the other frame orders. Now the advantage of this. Symbols are typically kept in single frame, except for maybe stuff like the head, or maybe sometimes the legs for walk cycles. If I need to do something like an angle change, all I need to do is select the symbol that is undergoing the angle change and increment its frame. If I go from, say, frame 11 to frame 21, I will switch from 3 quarters to front. This makes doing transitions significantly easier, as well as significantly cuts down on the number of symbols I use in my library. If I have things oriented correctly, I don't even have to provide any additional frame buffers when I'm creating a tween between two different angles. If you remember, I also mentioned that a lot of my design centers itself around keyframe caddy. Well, this is what I was talking about. I'm able to load up all the different states and variations into keyframe caddy so I can easily select between them without having much difficulty. Learning how to master doing individual frames and unique frame data like this is going to be a huge advantage when designing and animating puppet rigs. Otherwise, this should summarize all the core aspects behind rigging. You can go check out some of the other tutorials I have, such as how to animate specifically. Or you can go here and watch a time lapse of Socket's rig creation. And as always, if you have any questions about anything specific regarding flash rigging, don't hesitate to ask in the comments and I will answer to the best of my ability. Thank you for watching.